Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor, Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is just to eat meat and that's what you should do. But if uh, you're hiking or road tripping or stuck at work and you want something nutritious that is just meat, fat, and possibly salt, if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. I like this product not only because it is pure meat, but also because I really want the carnivore market to thrive as well. The more we support meat-only products, the more people will make meat-only products, and this will bring us into the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to check out, then take a look and use my discount code HTC to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks, guys. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the How To Carnival podcast. We're joined by Dr. Anthony Chafee, the plant-free MD again. Welcome, Anthony. Hey, yeah. Thanks, man. Good to see you. Likewise. Good to have you here. And we've got a special guest, Dr. Max Gulhain. Uh, I think I pronounced the last name right, uh, who's from Aubrey here in Australia, uh, and is a low carb slash carnivore doctor getting amazing results with his clients. Um, so I can't wait to learn more about you. Welcome, Max. Hey, Simon, how are you going? And hey, Anthony, good to be on your podcast, gentlemen. Good yeah, to have you yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Max had me on, on his podcast, which is great, and, uh, and had, a, had a great talk there. And so thankfully, uh, you were able to, to come on uh, with us. So that's great. Thank you for that. Yeah, awesome. I'm stoked to uh, to talk to you guys and uh, yeah, like uh, give you a bit of an idea about what's happening down here in Albury. Yeah, mm-hmm. it sounds like there is a lot happening between you and um, Jacob Walke, who Doc Chafee and I have also mm-hmm. interviewed. Um, he was awesome. So yeah, we had to get you on. Um, so Max, what what was it that triggered you to head down the low carb slash carnivore rabbit hole um, as as a doctor? Yeah, so I basically was. Uh, going through early 20s doing a bit of exercise doing a bit of cycling and not not having a lot of intentional thought about my diet and at the time I was drinking a lot of those up and go shakes you know we'd go for a big ride and before we'd go out we'd have an up and go eating oats you know all kinds of just generally not not junk but carbohydrate based based food that you know was thought was uh, healthy and throughout that early 20s, I, I developed quite bad acne on, on my face. And as you can imagine, it's not ideal to be you know, suffering from acne in the you know early, early 20s, where most people have that problem, you know, during their teenage years. So I, I developed this, this acne and, and I went at the time, I went to a, a dermatologist uh, after obviously failing the kind of first line treatment. And a story with the dermatologist was was I was put on you know escalating doses and of a progression of pharmaceutical drugs to kind of treat this this skin problem, and um, you know Anthony will know that that the I got put on uh, antibiotics like doxycycline, um, and doxycycline is a, a an antibiotic that we use for you know atypical pneumonias and you know if you get a, a cut by some mar- obscure marine bacterial pathogen you get put on doxycycline and you know if you go in for malaria prophylaxis you get put on doxycycline so it, it's an antibiotic and 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 that we're using it for, for acne treatment so i got on doxycycline didn't work got got went saw the dermatologist again got put on minocycline which is another tetracycline antibiotic that didn't work. So um, I ended up on a drug called Roaccutane or, or isotretinoin. And that's a pretty heavy duty um, a drug. It's a, it's a vitamin A analog and it's used for a, a whole range of kind of very specific, you know, medical treatment reasons. And that was around my, you know, early mid, mid twenties. And I just made me feel absolutely horrible. And this is a very protracted drawn out process um, and not once did the, did the dermatologist mention or, or discuss lifestyle and, and diet or anything like that. So I, I ended up going off off uh, the the isotretinoin because it just made my mood too bad. And and at that point, uh, I was in medical school, and um, it, around that time, there was a lot uh, about plant based eating. And maybe I was an early adopter. This was back in 2017. I thought, okay, plant based eating is good for me. It's good for the planet. You know, it's good for everyone. This is going to be a good solution to my health issue and to you know help every every everyone else. Short story, or to cut a long story short, uh, basically, you know, eighteen months of worsening acne, bloating, um, recurrent upper respiratory tract infections, just generally feeling quite off, uh, and no no improvement at all. 
So that kind of process of, you know, hitting kind of rock bottom um, with my skin, with my digestion um, and being in medical school, I, I thought, come on, there's got to be a better way around this. Um, and nothing I was being taught um, in medical school was giving me any answer to my own health problem. So at that point, I stumbled upon the Low Carb Down Under YouTube ch- YouTube page, which uh, a lot of you, your listeners would know is, a, is an amazing repository of, of information about uh, low carbohydrate and, and lifestyle medicine. And uh, at that point, I watched a lot of low carb videos. I cut out the grains, I cut out the sugar, you know, I cut out all the 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 tofu and all these kind of foods and, and my symptoms started getting better. Um, and just, it was a gradual and gradual and gradual improvement. And then uh, around the end of my medical school training, you know, I was eating a, a keto, you know, low carb diet. I had my kangaroo steak and, and, and my uh, salad, you know, in a salad that I was taking to, to, to medical school. And at that point, I was also watching a lot of Paul Saladino and Sean Baker, more, more of the carnivore type doctors. And I remember f- fiddling with my uh, meal and I'd eaten all my meat and I was, you know, gazing down at these spinach leaves. And I just thought to myself, like, is this really necessary? I, you know, as I'm trying to force them into my mouth. And at that point, I, I tried to go, um, I went full a full carnivore. And that process was um, very, very, very interesting because I, I found it basically another gear above. And I felt a, a amazing at, at another level above what I had been feeling. So that was in you know the beginning of 2019 and it's 23 now. So uh, I've been mostly carnivore since then. Um, periods of, of interspersed with um, some fruit consumption when I was living at a high latitude and, and periods of, of um, fermented veggies I'd, I'd include at some points. But um, having moved right back down to Aubrey, I'm I'm basically um, 100% carnivore again, uh, and feeling fantastic. So um, that that's I guess my story, and it's it's one of being a patient, I think, first, and mm-hmm. having that brush with the medical system, and and finding myself not being served and not being um, given the right advice. Uh, that was the kind of stimulus for me to explore this area and then offer that um, to my patients. Yeah. Well, great. And so have you been able to incorporate that in, into your practice as well? Yeah, so I have. I, I So I worked in um, emergency medicine um, after I graduated med school for, for a couple of years. And then I moved down to Albury particularly to do general practice training. And I chose this place because um, it's a mentor of mine, Dr. Rob Sabo, who you might know. He's, uh, he's a very experienced and, and old uh as in he's been in the game for a long time in diabetes reversal and using low carbon carnivore. So I moved, mm-hmm. I relocated here to, to kind of work with him and, and, and learn off him. And um, uh, yeah, that's what I've been doing. So since February, I've been um, using the low carbon carnivore as a, as a treatment option in, in patients who are interested and, and willing and uh, to reverse attempt to reverse their obesity, their metabolic disease, their fatty liver, um and yeah getting getting some really great results um already so it's been it's been fantastic right and what are are some of the results that you're getting is it just uh because there's obviously you know uh, professor steve finney has shown in in clinical trials that you can reverse type 2 diabetes with just a ketogenic diet in general which of course a carnivore diet is unless you're you know not just eating meat but if you are just eating meat then it should be um and so what, what have your results been yeah, so so my what I've seen so far in, is is mostly been weight loss. So I've had patients mm-hmm. come to me uh, for weight loss, and and look, I'll, I'll I give them an option, and I say, um, depending on what your lifestyle, depending on on where you're at, depending on your family situation, we can do this as quickly or as slowly as you'd like, and um, and certain group of patients. Um, yeah, we just lost Max for a by um, eating only meat, and those the results that I've seen from patients who are eating a mostly kind a carnivore diet and perhaps a restricted eating window or you know only one or two meals per day, um, you know within two weeks or after my initial consult, you know four kilo three kilos four kilos of weight, um, you know three four centimeters off the waist circumference, um, is very common. Um, and they're they're so happy. They they walk in with a, the biggest smile on their face, um, you know, beaming. And I'm I think of one patient in particular, and I've seen him about uh, you know, maybe three times or four times in the past two months. And uh, he walked into the room, you know, on, on uh, Thursday, 
And I could, you know, the amount of weight he's lost is it's incredible. You can see how how great he looks, and mm-hmm. and he's got so much energy. So yeah, it, it's it's going really well. Is he is right. he carnivore or low carb? He, he, so he's carnivore. He is mm-hmm. he's fully carnivore. Um, nice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so and so obviously because it, you know, you are limited in time in your consultations, you know, to to give that big full rundown on this. Obviously, it's not always possible to do that in in the consultation setting. You have a, a you know a, a packet of information and and things like that and homework to send them home to to go uh, you know read up on themselves. Yeah, definitely, and and I don't, unfortunately I don't have any to show you, but I basically mm-hmm. just made some um, uh, A five card printouts. Mm-hmm. And there's 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 four that I have. Um, one of them is what not to eat, um, mm-hmm. and that's just got my the three main criteria of of processed foods: um, the mm-hmm. carbo carbo and and carbs. So carbohydrates, seed oils, um, and sugars. And then I've got another one that's that's the low carb handout, and another one that's a, a specifically a carnival uh, handout, and mm-hmm. then a, a one that's just got general food rules. So I, I basically go over the the basics of it, and then I um, give them these these the patients the cards depending on what approach they want to take, and um, yeah, we 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 basically go from there. the The other thing that I do, which I've really found helpful, is I hand people off to my podcast and you know anthony we recorded uh, uh a couple months ago and i've got another great podcast with dr sean amara and these are really good um intro and dr kilts as well their introduction and and they cover carnivore in a in a really in a deeper way so it's it's an, it's a really useful tool to extend the value of the consult um and help the patient really understand because they can just hear hear us talk and hear uh, in, in a long form conversation and really backs up what I've kind of discussed briefly in, in the, in the consulting room. Oh, which is great. Um, and so I was just going to ask too, do you, do you track their, their lab results? Obviously you're going to be looking at their HPA1C, this is with diabetes. Um, you, you find, this is something that's been coming up recently. You know, uh, someone, someone on Twitter was saying that they, they're actually surprised, you know, they, they promote an omnivorous sort of diet, but they are, you know, quite interested and surprised that, you know, long-term carnivores like Michaela Peterson aren't really having any nutrient deficiencies. I'm not having nutrient deficiencies. A lot of other people aren't either. Uh, is this something that you uh, track with your patients and and what have you seen? Yeah. So the, the, the patients that I've, uh, that I'm treating have are basically starting their carnival journey. So mm-hmm. I haven't been uh, longitudinally following any long-term carnivores. Um, mm-hmm. The, so, so I, I I haven't seen any uh, frank deficiencies on, on people who have treated a long term carnival myself, and um, I, I I guess I, I look at a range of markers and um, thing as you mentioned insights into metabolic health and the way I I think about it is there's just simple simply like different windows into the same room when we think of things like you know raised fasting blood glucose you know a raised fasting insulin raised HbA one C um, and then you've got other markers like the, your your liver function, like your ALT, and and you know your urate levels. So the, the the way I think about it, they're just different organ manifestations of the un, common underlying you know metabolic dysfunction uh, process. But it, it, it's interesting how um you know we can measure all these labs, but so often it's simply just that waist measurement and calculating that waist to height ratio that I I like to use. Um, with a with a cutoff being you know 0.5 for guys and 0.48 for women that I use, um, it's just amazing how reliable that sim- simple measurement is, and that is such a reliable marker of visceral fat that um, you know if someone has a, a raised waist circumference, I'm I'm like a raised waist to height ratio, I'm like well there's your problem, and, and mm-hmm. the test the the labs are just simply confirming what what we what we already know, and and I, and I talked to Sean O'Mara and 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 he basically ran a concierge medical uh, clinic process for, you know, heads of state. And he said, you know, look, I, I had every lab, you know, at my fingertips, but essentially the most useful thing is, is identifying visceral fat. And, and he's using whole body MRI scanning to uh, mm-hmm. look at visceral fat at different parts of the body. So around the heart, obviously around, around the abdomen, and then looking at fatty infiltrate in the muscle, which is called myocytosis and just essentially identifying and showing the patient their visceral fat, um, is is just such a powerful way of 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 identifying um, you know their metabolic dysfunction and and then giving them something to kind of hang on to 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 measure their pre- pre- uh, their um, progress against. 
you know, I was, um, you know, that reminds me, you know, looking at that, you know, visceral fat and the, and the myositosis, like intramuscular fat, that's something that the you know, point that I've made, you know, when you, when you're metabolically unhealthy, it's the same thing that's going to be causing that as it's causing metabolic unhealth, which is like, you know, carb, sugar, things like that. It disrupts your metabolism. It disrupts your, uh, your, your biochemistry and puts you in a different biochemical state and you start storing fat in different areas. And this is why we give grains to cows and they get intramuscular fat. And so why would we think that, they, that we're any different? Uh, we're not. I look at MRIs every damn day and I see this stuff. I see this intramuscular fat. You know, when I'm looking at the spine, you know, I look, you know, we're seeing down, uh, you know, you know, the different sort of, you know, uh, paraspinal muscles and, and the different muscles, you know, in the abdomen uh, that you can see uh, on these MRIs. And you, you can see this, you can see this fat in, in the muscle and it fits their, their body habitus and their, and their lifestyle. And so I make this point, and then I think, uh, you know, uh, people like, you know, uh, you know, Lane Norton, things like that. It's like, oh my God, what is this hogwash? And it's called biochemistry, Lane. You know, you might want to look into it, you know? And um, and that and that's the thing. And that, and, that's, and, and that is what we are seeing as clinicians. You know, we are looking at the scans. He's not looking at scans. He, he's never seen a patient. He's he's not a medical practitioner. And so all of his all of his entire field is, is purely theoretical and wrong. And so, you know, when you look at these things in practice and you see actual patients in the, in the real world setting, you see this intramuscular fat, you see yes. this, this deposition of fat in the muscles. And that is, that is a clear sign of, 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 uh, metabolic dysfunction and, and poor health and also pain. Um, there was a, there was a conference in spinal surgery, um, that they were talking about that, that intramuscular fat in the, in the paraspinal muscles and things like that, that correlates very strongly with back pain and, and back pain that was not going to be fixed with surgery. So, you know, I mean, it actually, it is something that we see and it looks like, you know, you're seeing this as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that actually was the stimulus for Dr. Ma Sean Amara to actually look at visceral fat because they were mm -hmm. doing a, a, a case series or a, a very long cohort um, analysis on people with lower back pain because it's so common in the US. And what they've yeah. noticed after just looking after MRI after MRI after MRI is that the common denominator for the patients with symptomatic back pain was the presence of visceral fat. So if you've got this this visceral fat that's pro-inflammatory, that's leaching out these these pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, you know, sensitizing the nerves, all this kind of thing, and um, you know that that's that's your answer into to why these patients are having pain. So you know the visceral fat is underlying this disease this disease process. It's a common denominator, and you know you can go into PubMed and you can type in you know kind of any disease um, basically and visceral fat. And you will find that that's that's the common denominator. You know, polycystic ovary syndrome and, and visceral fat. You know, hypertension know. and visceral fat. Obviously, diabetes and visceral fat. Um, you know, mm. fatty liver and visceral fat. It's all if if the presence of visceral fat is the you know, in my opinion, the the primary disease process that's driving this smoldering metabolic inflammation that is causing so much uh, you know morbidity and 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 so much pain in in, in chronic and chronic disease in general. Yeah. Is it one, one thing, because I, I follow Dr. Sean O'Meara as well, and I really like his stuff. And I've sort of wondered whether it's the, it, it sounds like the visceral fat is causing the issues rather than just being the result of poor metabolic health and poor overall health. Is that kind of, is that kind of the gist, Max? Yeah, look, that that's how, that's how I think about it. And, um, you know, if we, we think about the con contributors to visceral fat, um, you know, processed food, seed oils, carbs, and sugars, you know, alcohol, um stress so cortisol yeah. constant stress and, and higher cortisol causes deposition of, of visceral fat um circadian disruption and um, mm -hmm. you know that's the reason i'm wearing these glasses it's a, it's chronic exposure to to blue light um and, and disruption of the normal circadian rhythm will and poor sleep will cause deposition of, of visceral fat um and omar is also Dr. Omar has also noticed uh, chronic cardio exercises can can lead to, to visceral fat deposition. So the, these are the processes that are that are I guess all contributing to the accumulation of visceral fat. And yeah, it, I think that's the the, the primary problem. Um, and if we think biochemically, and um, you know the the when there is stress of those adipocytes through you know exposure to uh, excessive you know, linoleic acid breakdown products from um, seed oils, uh, you know, too much sugar, uh, carbohydrates, that the, 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 the stress in those adipocytes then kind of st starts 
making them spill out pro-inflammatory factors, which then um, causes insulin resistance in the liver, uh, you know, and then the process goes from there. So yeah, the, the, the crux of the issue, and I guess the simple, um, uh, the answer is that, you know, measure that waist circumference uh, if you if you don't have any resources. And if you have, you know, the most resources, get a full body MRI, get an MRI and look at it, but identify your visceral fat and then do something about it. Um, I think that's the, that's the main message. Mm. Yeah. Um, Max, Dr. Sean O'Mara is also like big into sprint, into sprinting and resistance exercise uh, and obviously sleep and stuff as well. Do you try and get that kind of whole message across or, or is it purely nutrition? Yeah. So, so that's a good question. And, and look, I, I try and approach this uh, problem um, as holistically as possible. And I actually take it even as a step further back from that. And I, and I use a dichotomy that uh, Dr. Lucy Burns is kind of uses, which is the drivers of visceral fat and obesity, s- physiology and psychology. So, um, everything about visceral fat that we've talked about falls under the physiology category, but almost equally important is the, is the psychology side of things. And uh, I kind of break that down. I, 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 and I talk to patients about this because you can have, you can understand, um, you know, in your, in your brain, your higher, in your cortex, you can understand the concepts of insulin resistance. You can understand all these, um, you know, biochemical pathways, but if you have, behavior patterns, entrenched habit loops that are sabotaging, you know, is a form of self-sabotage and kind of facilitating a food or sugar addiction, then it doesn't matter how much, how much uh, you, you understand that intellectually, you, you're not going to make any progress from a health point of view. So um, as I mentioned, it's like identifying what, what kind of deep seated trauma is in place, you know, what, what, what um, com- are their comfort eating? Is this a form of self-medication of anxiety and and when I kind of discuss those things um, with with patients who are struggling to lose weight or um, you know who, who who are even admitted that they that they use sugary foods as a kind of crutch, then I think um, helping them on a concurrent journey of addressing the the psychological drivers and the physiological drivers uh, is is the most effective approach. Um, but or to your point about exercise, uh, and that's another another interesting point. I'm of the opinion that we have to address uh, the diet first. Um, Mm -hmm. And often people are so um, weighed down by brain fog Mm -hmm. and by just general fatigue of, of being in this, you know, inflamed metabolic state that, you know, making them exercise or or prescribing exercise before we've made headway on these, on this brain fog and this general feeling of tiredness is, is not really appropriate. Um, and you know, when you, I'm sure you guys have seen, you know, driving on a Sunday morning, you see overweight people flogging themselves in a (laughs) CrossFit gym, you know, under fluorescent light at 7am on a Sunday morning, you know, sweating buckets. And I just feel so bad for them because, you know, that, that is not the, the, the correct order of operations in my mind. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's all about, um, allowing that initial healing phase, in my opinion, um, to mm-hmm. occur with our diet, our light, light diet and our food diet. And then once they've, once they've got more energy, recommending resistance training, walking, where, mm-hmm. wherever the patient's at. Um, so that's my yeah. spot on. Yeah, well, I was just going to say quickly, uh, you know, I, I agree with that. And, and, uh, I think that a lot of people, especially now are in a state that, that they really do need to address the diet side first and get into a point of health that they can even safely exercise or have the energy to exercise. Some people, you know, are, are very unwell, very sick. And, you know, the weight can be a problem, a part of that, but there's, there's generally more health issues going on as well. And addressing the diet and addressing that and fixing that first, and they get, start feeling better. Their body starts working better. They're going to get a lot more out of their exercise as well. Yes. Gonna, you know, the, the amount of effort that they put in, they'll get a lot more return on their investment as, as well. I, I remember seeing something, I think, um, Dr. Peter Atia was on, maybe, maybe it was Huberman. And it was just a sort of a quick clip. And he said that, uh, that he thinks that, that the main thing is, is exercise. He thinks it's the most thing is exercise. And he's just saying, Hey, if you can't do 10 pull-ups, if you can't do 50 push-ups or, or whatever he said, you know, if you can't do certain exercises, uh, to a certain degree, you know, you need to focus on that first. You don't want to like talk split hairs about, you know, the, you know, the, the, the fine details about perfecting a carnivore diet or a keto diet or whatever diet you, know, you need to address that first. And, and I agree in the sense that, 
you know, if you've already got the diet down and then you're just, you're just, you know, doing these fine little tweaks, probably not, you know, the best, um, you know, value for money. Right. Um, and that you need to start working out. So like, you know, us in our, in our case here, are we going to get the most bang for our buck saying, well, if you, if you just tweak it just like this, you know, that's going to change it really, you, you know, the three of us need to go to the gym, you know, that's where we're at. That's where we're going to get, you know, more value for our money. Uh, whereas, someone else who's just coming to this and hasn't, um, you know, lost the weight and, uh, or started to lose weight and started to reverse their health issues. They might not be in a position that they're ever going to be able to do 10, 10 pull-ups. You know, maybe they need to lose 200 pounds first before they could start, start doing pull-ups as well. And so I think that, that you, that you do have to get that order right. And especially depending on where someone's coming from, if they're quite unhealthy, you really need to get that diet right first. You need to get their health in order uh, if from that standpoint first, and then, then you maximize it with resistance training and so on. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, look, it, I think it also feeds into this kind of, uh, collective societal trauma around food and eating and diet. And, uh, I, I gave a, a talk recently at, um, a, at a restaurant here in New Albury, um, at the same time as Jake. And I talked about the, this idea of the dietary guidelines and how, it's been, you know, since 1982 was the first edition of the Australian Dietary Guidelines. And mm -hmm. you can plot the uh, proportion of adults in Australia who are overweight and obese. And it was somewhere around 13% in the early 80s. And, you know, it's now it's sitting, you know, well above 20%. Um, and you can just see at each interval of the a new edition has been released, you know, there's no attenuation of that curve and that trend line up and to the mm -hmm. right. And, you know, as you and I, Anthony and, and Simon, we'd, we'd make the claim that, in fact, these guidelines have actually exacerbated the, the problem. So you've had a, a, a basically generation of people who have, I think, have a form of psychological trauma um, because they've developed, they've followed guidelines. And I think people are, um, they often, they're doing the right thing. They're trying to do what they think is the right thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yet they put on all this weight. Um, and they've been told to eat less and move more. So to 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 kind of emphasize exercise as the first port of call for weight loss um, and metabolic health is almost, to, in my mind, really feeding into that um, you know victim blaming mindset of you know you're just lazy. You know you need to just yeah. exercise some more. So I completely disagree with that. And mm -hmm. um, again, we can talk about the biochemistry of say um, patients with uh, you know awaiting osteoarthritis, awaiting joint replacement. We know mm -hmm. that when when they resolve that metabolic dysfunction um, and and that that fatty liver, they get improvements in joint pain uh, that are unrelated to mechanical loading. So, so the, the liver stops making, you know, matrix metalloproteinases that are inflaming those articular surfaces. Um, that's got nothing to do with actual weight loss. Um, it's to do with the metabolic inflammation that's happening in the body and the, the hyperinsulinemia. So, um, and once those patients have, have, you know, after a couple of weeks, got that that initial phase of of uh, improving in their metabolic function, there, then their joints hurt less, and then they can start doing some exercise. So um, again, it's it's all about the order of operations, and I really think we have to look at diet, light diet, food diet, um, before we recommend exercise. Yeah, and 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 yeah, exactly, and especially for people that are that are unwell. You know, if this is just just someone who's just trying to like just improve their health and and do whatever. Um, and is is in relatively good shape, you know. Well, then they can they can absolutely incorporate an exercise program along with dietary changes. Um, you know, I think I think what um, Dr. T was saying uh, was that you know if you've been on on some like a carnivore diet for a while and you've been doing that for a while, you know, getting into the 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 sort of the last bits of, of fine tuning it, you know, maybe you should maybe you should look at at um, you know, at, at something that's more on broken ground that you should, you should uh, spend your time on. And I've, I've got a lot of respect for him as well. I don't want to, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, people that think that I, that I'm, that I'm, I'm bashing him because I'm not, I'm just, I'm just saying that, that I, I think it's very important to make that distinction that yeah. if someone is unhealthy and someone has, you know, weight to lose, but metabolic issues to reverse that that's really important because the first thing that, that, that popped in my mind when, when you said that was just like, well, I mean, someone, some people can't do a put push up, a pull up, and they're not going to be able to until, you know, they, they get their health in order and the diet is going to, is going to facilitate that. And the diet's going to get them in, into a point of health that they're able to exercise that they're able 
to do push-ups and sit-ups and, and pull-ups and things like that. So I think that it depends on where you're starting from. And, and if someone's quite unwell, I think absolutely the diet. And even, even, even for someone who's in relatively good shape and lean, I think, I think diet is way more important getting that right than, than just the exercise. Like I don't exercise all that often. I love exercising. I feel much better when I do it, but I guess I just, you know, I don't always have the time. And so, but with my diet, I'm always in shape. I'm never out of shape. I can get in better shape but I'm never out of shape. I never go out of shape and I always feel great. And depending on you know, whatever you're doing, you know, if you're eating right, you're going to get more out of it. You know, you're, the exercise that you do, the hard work that you put in is, and, and, the, and the benefit that you get out of it is a direct function of what's going in your body. And so if you're putting in high octane crap or even a little bit of crap, you know, you're not going to be working pro- quite right. The body's not going to be able to respond in quite the same way. You're not going to be able to work as hard. You're not going to be able to push yourself. You're not going to be able to recover as well and heal as well and build as well. And so I think that I think that you, I fully agree with you that you'd get the diet right first and then you start looking at other pastures. But, you know, but at the same time, if you're eating 97% meat and maybe you have a little bit here and there, you know, I think you can, you can now start looking at, at other things as well, if you're healthy enough. Yeah, no, good. that's a, that's a very good point. And, um, you know, I, I sometimes say to patients, you know, imagine if you had a Ferrari and you're pouring in, you know, cheap ethanol fuel into the tank. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah, sure. You might fill up a couple of tanks and it won't make any difference, but if you've done 10 years of putting ethanol in your, you know, V12, uh, sports car engine, you, you're mm-hmm. going to expect there's going to be wear and tear. So, um, uh, and I, I, sh- I don't know about exactly your audience, um, Anthony, but uh, it's very important to make that distinction. And and if you're a patient, if you're taking medications, taking insulin, high anti uh, blood pressure medications, you're you're really in a different category to people who are just maybe a little bit overweight and want to, wanting to lose a bit of weight, and you know. Uh, able to exercise have no pre-existing medical conditions so you know those are two different groups of people and and i'm, I'm really speaking uh to the, to the to the patients because those type of people um really should be seeing someone um and especially if they want to try and come off medications um uh you know look and and here was a here's a story on not too long ago I, I had a patient and she has you know quite severe uh had quite severe heart failure um and you know started a, a carnival type diet uh themselves and uh, you know, and amazing results. I mean, in three weeks, lost nine kilograms, and symptoms of exertional dis- uh, breathlessness had, had was resolving. Uh, fluid that had been retained for a very long time is coming off. But um, it, it's interesting how that this is such a powerful therapeutic tool. But if you're a patient and you're unwell and you're medicated, it really should be supervised because um, we need to be helping you and guiding you through the process of 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 often de-prescribing uh, these medications mm. not not just doing it um by kind of by by itself yeah that, that's really important and that's that's something I, I try to stress to people that when you you do need the the guidance of a doctor if you're if you're on different medications especially blood pressure blood sugar medications because you you will be over medicated quite quickly which is good you know you're you're going to need less medications because your body's getting better on its own. You don't, you don't need them. But the problem is, is that if you're still on them, then it can be much too much. You get, you can get, potentially get low blood sugar, which can be dangerous or life-threatening. And you can get low, very low blood pressure. which can also be life-threatening and dangerous. And just by simple virtue of the fact you get up, you get lightheaded, you fall down, you hit your head and, you know, you don't wake up again. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, and so it's very important to be cognizant of that. And, and to talk to your doctor ahead of time and just think, saying, hey, this is what I'm doing. These are the results other people are getting. They expect that this will go in that way. You know, I may be needing to titrate my medications down. Let's work together on that. And, um, and, uh, and hopefully you have a doctor that, that's you know, willing and able to do that. And, uh, but yeah, it's very, very important because you run into serious trouble when medications are involved. Yeah. Yeah, so um, very, very strongly encourage everyone. Um, and and look, that's it. That's another part of, I think the uh, what what we as doctors owe to our patients. Um, you know, we we owe it to our patients to be able to facilitate that process. You know, there's there's safe injecting rooms for people who choose to use, um, you know, intravenous drugs. So um, people are going to make lifestyle changes, whether or not it's been you know officially sanctioned 
from every kind of you know body body so if, if people are going to do it we, we we need as doctors need to be in a position to be able to help them and safely support them in, in whatever choice they make so um that's that's a, i guess a, a call to um you know any doctors listening to try and understand this process because um you know your patients need you as this um you know the the lifestyle um benefits have become so more and more well known that people are going to be doing these kind of things by themselves if if there's no one else to help them um some some you're muted sorry guys uh max you got a very powerful message and you're already helping people what's kind of the next step for you like what where, where, where do you want to take this this practice and this message yeah so uh, i think that the the message that i want to promote as widely as i can or uh, is the access to lifestyle advice to help people thrive and you know i, I really conceive of this or, or my my role in uh, I've got a kind of stair type diagram. So if if your listeners can imagine three stairs, and at the bottom of the stair, you you've got a, a person who, who's dying. They're in a hospital bed. They're dying. You mm -hmm. you go up one stair, and there there's someone who's merely surviving. And I think that's the majority of people in today in the West and around the world is that they yeah they're going to their job. You know they're getting things done. But, you know, they're miserable, they might be anxious or depressed, they're overweight, they've got metabolic dysfunction, they've, they've, they've got visceral fat, they might have irregular periods, they might be suffering from infertility, um, you know, polycystic ovary syndrome, all the rest. So they have menorrhagia and erectile dysfunction, you know, you name it. They're, they're in that middle step, which is merely, merely surviving. There's a third step, um, and that is the top step, which is thriving. And that is what everyone is capable of and that's you know having boundless energy waking up um grateful and happy and joyful full of energy every morning having uh energy to uh look after yourself um and i always say to patients you know you've got to put your oxygen mask on but first before you help anyone else when you are at that top level when you are thriving not, you you are able to help everyone around you. You are able to be a better partner, a better um son, you know, a better father, a better um contributor to the people in your community and um, and and to get from those different steps well what gets you from dying to surviving that's that's modern medicine and that's that's what we anthony and i i got taught at medical school um but modern medicine can't get you from surviving to thriving to get to that top step you need optimal diet and lifestyle so i guess my, my focus um is really um giving the idea or, or promoting the idea that um, we need that that optimal diet and lifestyle to help our patients get, um, hopefully, from either dying or, or merely surviving to living their most op optimal self. And, you know, there's so many facets to this, but obviously the, the low carbohydrate and, and animal-based diet is is key because, you know, like, like Anthony, I believe that that's the most evolutionarily um, appropriate diet. Um, a key kind of branch or facet to, to this whole idea is that, what are the ethical obligations for someone who is recommending such wide consumption of, of animal foods? And this is where my kind of link and my um, partnership with Jake Wolke at the Wolke farm, um, who, which is a regenerative farm comes in because if, if I'm telling people, you know, look, you should only be eating meat then, or, or you, that's an option for you. Then what, what I, I believe there is an obligation is that meat should be ethically raised in the most, with the highest ethical standards so that there's a least amount of animal suffering um it should it should be the least um impactful to the environment um and ideally if it can regenerate the environment then that that would be ideal so and uh, that's where regenerative farming comes in and basically uh the process of of grazing the cattle in an intensively holistic way which involves regular paddock moves um and allowing paddocks to regenerate and grow after you know over a period of months that that type of agricultural technique provides the most nutrient dense food because the animals are, are in their their native uh, habitat eating a, a, their species appropriate diet so um the the kind of holistic even you know bigger picture view is to, to get optimal human health, we need optimal animal health. We need to be eating the healthiest animals. And to be eating the healthiest animals, we need the, 
the healthiest soil. So to take my approach all the way back to its fundamentals, um, regenerative farming is at the base at the base of that process. And the more people we can promote and to, to support regenerative farming, the more land we can improve um, in terms of soil quality, microbial quality, um, uh, and, and other kind of environmental indices. The more animals we save from um, factory farming, the more pigs we take out of these hideous um you know factory farms and these these poor chickens that are getting their beaks cut off um which people don't re realize if they're buying you know Woolworth's meat so um that's i guess the holistic picture and it's funny because the holistic human health requires holistic animal and ecosystem health so i guess that's the vision um to answer your question in a very long way uh simon is that it, this is a this is a, a holistic vision um and it and it goes way beyond just the just the gp clinic room Awesome. And that, that sort of ties into the other question we were talking about just before we, we went on, which was, you know, what, what sparked you to start the podcast in the first place? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, the, I've been following the low carb as I, as I talked, said, mentioned earlier, I've been following low carb down under, you know, for five, six years. And I, um, I thought there came a point where I realized that it wasn't okay anymore to just be a, a merely a bystander. Um, you know, in, in that Spider-Man movie with great, you know, great power comes great responsibility. If I, if I had a, 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 a yeah, if I had an understanding like a, a, a biochemical and a physiological understanding of, of how to help people after, and having seen that with my, my, have my own experience, uh, I felt I had an obligation to really um, speak and advocate on behalf of, of this approach. If it meant helping patients avoid what I had to go through, which was, you know, a couple of years of, of uh, unnecessarily pharma uh, pharmaceutical treatment of a condition that didn't even address its underlying causes. Um, so I I see, and I, I continue to see so much suffering um, and unnecessary suffering, which uh, was was the kind of stimulus for me to, yeah, be a bit more vocal and, and hopefully help people by giving them access to information. And, you know, I, I can see a patient for half an hour and I might see, you know, 18 patients a day but, um, you know, Anthony, 26,000 people have watched our interview. So, I mean, wow. how, how powerful nice. is that? Nice um, work, so guys. It, it, it's and not to brag, but simply to illustrate the power of social media and, yeah. and, and, and um, you know, these online platforms for helping people help themselves. Um, so, so that's, and that's the crux of it. Um, and I'm sure Anthony, you'd agree is that you can't help anyone who does isn't ready to themselves to be helped so i don't i don't push anything on anyone I, I i see myself as just um someone who's there to give a patient options and support them with whatever decision they want to choose and there will be people that for whatever reason their life circumstances then they're not yet ready to give away their their prescription for their um, diabetic medication they're not yet ready to make big dietary changes that's fine i meet them where they are but for people who are willing and able they and and would do something about it then they deserve access to the information mm -hmm. to help themselves so uh, i guess that that's why I, I i've been more vocal lately about my about this approach oh that's good how, how long have you podcast now oh I, I think we started in um december so it's been five months oh great nice. yeah 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 that's awesome well i, I you know, I, I agree. You know, it's, it's, I think it is really important to get this stuff out there and to reach more people, you know, and even, in, even in my, my local community, like when I, you know, just me living the way I do and, and, and eating the way I do and talking to people, you know, they say like, Oh, what's that about? And then I talk to them, I have one-on-one -on -one conversations and, you know, especially, especially doctors, like, and they're like, that makes sense. All of this stuff checks out. And, you know, can you send me some of those resources? Absolutely. And then you do, and they go like, okay. And a lot of people buy into it and and change it themselves, and then they that, that sort of branches out from there. But it was when I I you know was doing more podcasts and just being interviewed on other people's podcasts, other people started seeing them, and even you know even like the the consultants and things like that in my department started seeing my podcast uh, before I started my podcast, and they were like, hey, you know, so I saw the podcast you were on. I'm like, really? Like, why why would you do that? And you know, but they were interested about it, and they you would ask me more about it, and. And um, same thing, it'd be like, yeah, you know, it makes sense. Like what you're saying makes sense. And um, and so you go on like that. But it wasn't until I, I started my own podcast that 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 really started to get e even bigger and bigger. And then and people in Earth, in, in particular, started started. I, I mean, I've had I've had doctors that you know I've interacted with 
uh, but have never spoken about my diet and choices uh, with, all of a sudden they'll, they'll just come up to me and just start talking to me and just deep in it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, I saw that guy that was on your, you know, uh, you know, like uh, we were talking about like, um, you know, like uh, the guy from Mason Survival uh, who does like really slow, like exercise in his backyard and, and just, just lifting weights in his, in his backyard. And, um, and uh, it's like, oh yeah, I really like that. And, you know, I mean, once a day I'm doing like, this. And he's like talking to me, like we've had a thousand conversations about this and I've never spoken to him about this in my life. And, uh, and it's really interesting because, you know, they've obviously seen, you know, my podcast they've seen my things and that's influenced them to change their lives. And um, yeah, which is, which is great, you know? And so it's, it's something that you can reach a lot more people with. Yeah. And, and you can't under, you can't underestimate the the positive effects that, that you can have and even helping, you know, one person, the patient will come in, but often if yeah. they're in a family, the people in the family are making yeah. the same dietary changes. So it's, it's incredible and, and really encouraging to see the rippling mm. effect of a positive or positive lifestyle changes um, on, on the whole families and then communities. And I think, you know, to, to not to sound too idealistic, but, uh, you know, this is how the world changes one person at a time. And as that one person changes, then the family can change. Then the family changes, a community changes, and then it's the town, then it's the city, the country. And then, you know, it, it, it ripples out concentrically, but it starts with the individual. Mm. Mm. And, and just, uh, you know, the Jordan Peterson comment of just like, you know, what, what can I do to change the world? What can I do to all these sorts of things? Like clean your room, you know, start at the beginning. You know, like, well, how do I get my life in order? You clean your room. How do I change the world? You clean your room. You start there. You clean your room. You do that. Then you start saying, okay, I clean my room. That's done. What else can I fix? What else can I can I do in my life? If you get your life in order, you're going to have, you're going to be that first person. You're going to be that ripple or that, that pebble that starts the ripple in the lake. And that's something that can grow, but it has to start with you. And you can't just say like, well, my life is shit. So I'm going to go over here and try to, you know, uh, change other people's lives. Well, that's not how it's going to work. We're saying my life is shit because the world is shit. So I have to go fix. No, no, no. You can fix things in your own life. That's really the only thing you have control over. But once you do that, then you start affecting other people. And th this was the idea in America of just decentralizing everything, just having things in just your own, it, the individual first, and then going into the smaller communities and you deciding and fixing your own life and living your own life, taking care of your own life. And then making communities together of, of like-minded individuals and being able to self-govern and say, okay, well, this is, these are the rules that we want to play by and that we're happy with. And, and it just goes out from there and out from there and out from there. And, you know, you had 150 years of that model in America. And that was the, that was the, the largest and fastest growth and prosperity at the bottom level that the world has ever seen. No, no other society has ever grown in prosperity um, or the lowest level up than, than in that period of 150 years uh, before, you know, the, before like, you know, the, you know, Woodrow Wilson came in and, and, you know, the Fed and, and uh, the, um, all the different changes that FDR made. So, you know, it was, it was very, very, very good for people starting off as the individual, taking care of your life, taking control of your life, and then working out from there. And so it, you know, absolutely makes a massive difference uh, on yourself, but also in your community and the world at large. Yeah. Yeah. And you look, you don't even have to have, you know, grandly altruistic plans to um, kind of take this kind of message on board, because even if, if your, your uh, altruism only goes as far as your family, um, you know, how can you help someone if you yourself are sick? I mean, you can't. Um, you're you're not you're not of use to to anyone if you're you you haven't, as Anthony said, cleaned your own room. So you know, fix, clean up your own clean up your own diet first, and then you're going to have enough energy, power, and um, strength to kind of help help the people around you. Um, on the topic of of that, of what you just mentioned, decentralization. I think that is essentially what what I I believe is is the solution in, and and what we're doing or what we're encouraging is a decentralization of the sourcing of our food. Mm. And it's we're, we're going from a model where people are, are, have been historically sourcing their meat from feedlot, factory farmed pork, factory farmed chicken, caged eggs with all, all the poor uh, animal welfare, or they've sourced it from a massively centralized 
cropped crop monocropped farm that's using all manner of industrial uh herbicides petrochemical derived fertilizers fungicides and they're still very centralized and what what we're seeing works in terms of helping people's health is a decentralized approach where you've got hubs like in your your regenerative farms like the Walkie farm um you know there's a there's a farm tall poppy farm down north in mount macedon near melbourne these are like little hubs and each of them are growing their own version of the most nutrient dense food and when we interact with them directly as consumers um, and support them directly we're kind of we're cutting out all those big centralized players that have through you know centralizing of the their uh supply chain made everyone sick or supplied the food that has made everyone metabolically unwell so by really um changing the scale of of our consumption as consumers that's i think a, a critical part and, and as you say anthony it's that decentralized aspect to it i think is is key yeah yeah and, and even just you know taking control of, of where your food comes from you can always you can always find a wolky farm or you can find someone who's doing something in a way that you want and you can you can go direct to the source you know and, and you know some you're in the business you know that that um you know that that a that it matters where you're coming from but also that there are options you know that people can you know you know go to go to you and, and get you know this this meat that you source go to directly to a farmer it's not it's, it's more difficult in in australia in america you can just you just call a farmer, call a rancher and just say, Hey, I want a cow, you know, and you mm -hmm. say, okay, fine. You negotiate a price and you get it. And, um, and, but that, that's really important for a supporting, supporting those, those local businesses, but also they get more money from, from you buying direct from them and you get it for much less money as well. As long as you're buying in bulk, obviously you have to buy the whole thing. Um, and, and that, that helps everyone. And that, that keeps those supply lines running. Because right now there's there's some weird weird war on uh, on on meat and in general and people just they just want to shut that down. You know there've been dozens of of uh, fires of uh, you know meat processing plants in America just last year. Over a thousand uh, chicken uh, ranches and egg farms and things like that yeah. burned down just last year in America. Over a thousand. How could that be coincidence? How can those all have been accidents? You know, they're, they're not. I mean, someone someone is doing something deliberately um, for who I don't know who it is. I don't know why they're doing it. I don't know what the motivations are, but something's happening and people are doing this and it is it is damaging the food supply and it's making things more expensive. Whereas if you just support your local farmer, rancher, whatever, that's going to be better for the environment. It's going to be better for the animals. It's going to be better for you. And it's going to keep those supply lines open because once those are gone, you're in trouble. And like when, if, I mean, any war, anyone, everyone knows it's all about supplies, all about supply lines, your supply lines get cut. You're in trouble. You're, you are going to lose. You're going to have to run away and people are going to die. So, um, you know, just like with that, um, interview I had with Maggie, uh, the rancher up in, in Canada, I mean, she was saying, she's like, ranchers are going out of business. Ranchers are getting put out of business because it's just not, it's not profitable to raise cattle anymore. Mm -hmm. There's like, big beef and all these sorts of things. There is no such thing. These people are barely making ends meet. And a lot of the times they're, they're not, and they're, and they're, and they're having to switch to something else and they're using their land or rather selling their land because it's very valuable now, uh, or they're, they're turning to, to cash crops, like, you know, corn and wheat because they get paid for that. They actually get a, they get a much higher, uh, uh, payback for that. And so, you know, we can, we can turn everybody's hearts and minds and say, Hey, meat is really the way to go. But if those supplies are cut and those supply lines aren't there, there's not going to be anything for them to buy and to eat. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good point. And um, uh, earlier in the year, I, I actually spoke at a, uh, an event called the Australian Beef Initiative, um, mm -hmm. again, which was hosted down here in Albury at, at the Walkie Farm. And it's basically a movement um, with a bunch of people. There's a, a guy called Texas Slim from the US, from Texas. And right, he's... Man. Yeah, yeah, he's uh he's he's spearheading a movement to really promote that grassroots sourcing of beef and really promoting people, um, trading directly with a farmer for regenerative meat as a way of 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 feeding into what you've what Anthony's just talked about, which is food security, food sovereignty, food transparency. So knowing knowing that your cow hasn't been you know injected with all manner of synthetic uh, hormonal agents, uh, so it's a really uh, 
really great kind of grassroots movement. I've got some uh some interviews on on my channel with um with Texas Slim. So um it's it's a it's a really interesting way that there's a kind of spontaneous uh decentralized movement that seems to be generating in response to to the events that you've talked about, Anthony, just then about um things like uh, COVID shutdowns of abattoirs, these massive abattoirs and processing plants, because they're, they're simply just, they're, they're points of failure um, and they're centralized and they're points of failure. So, you know, if we can reduce that level of centralization and go back to to a really uh, grassroots kind of um, movement, then people, everyone wins. The farmer wins. They make more money. They are able to keep their farm. The the cow wins because it's 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 finally treated ethically, um, and it's able to 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 live in its appropriate environment. And you win because you're getting food that you know where it's come from, and you know it's the most uh, uh, nutrient dense. So I mean, th- those are all the the kind of positive. Uh, externalities of 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 this approach and look at so many people can be sitting behind their computer or just you know commenting on youtube like how about next weekend i mean here's a suggestion instead of sitting down and you know watching your phone actually look up a, a regenerative farm and go and meet go ask them to meet them and and go to that farm um you have a look around they're so these people are so willing and 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 lovely and welcoming they'll want to show you a, around so go and talk to the farmer and make it a make a day out of it meet your farmer um buy some um beef off them and um it's a, it's a great way to be involved and it's actually something you can do rather than just you know talking about or uh you know typing online about <laughs> awesome. um, max i think you got it figured out big time so just <laughs> Keep going and uh, and keep talking about it. Um, wh- how do people find you? How do people get more from you? Yeah, so um, if you just type in, so I, I have a podcast, a re- regenerative health podcast, and yeah, talking to uh, regenerative farmers, lifestyle doctors, um, you know, cutting it, cutting edge health optimization people, just just everything in that that uh, is reg- regarding holistic health. Um, also, an interest in fertility and helping couples kind of optimize their fertility before trying to to conceive because i mean that's another whole issue that we haven't even talked about which is declining sperm counts and 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 reproductive problems so um yeah the regenerative health podcast is on apple uh podcasts spotify google podcasts and i'm on twitter at uh m gulhane md and i'm on instagram at dr underscore max underscore gulhane and then uh, I'm, I'm consulting here in Albury at, uh, in general practice at the Gardens Medical Group. Uh, and you can ring up and if you want to uh, see me or get consulted, um, you I can do telehealth for anyone in Australia. There won't be a Medicare rebate um, or else you can come and see me in person. So, um, yeah, those, those are the, the main channels that I'm active through at the moment. Very cool. Love it. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, man. It was, it was uh, good to see you again and a pleasure to have you on and, and great to hear your thoughts on everything. Yeah. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks. And Simon, I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to your audience. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Our thanks. pleasure. Thanks for joining, Matt.